Right. So now we're on a new topic. And um, so far, we've been talking about primarily supervised learning, right? Now, we're going to be entering into several topics which may not necessarily always be relying on supervised learning, OK? Um, you talk about uh, generative adversarial networks, GANs. People might have been familiar with things like deep fakes and you know, GANs, which have been used to, you know, style GAN, for example, which can be used to generate artificial uh, faces and so on. Okay. So you can see that they don't necessarily uh, use always um, label data. Okay. So you look at several examples. But first of all, let's take a look at what are referred to as autoencoders. So the idea of autoencoders is to be able to compress data. Okay, sometimes you have uh, data which is extremely, looks very complex, but uh, un underlying it may have a very simple structure. Okay, um, or it may be a very complex image, but you want to compress it. Okay, and you want to make it as simple as, as possible and try to find out what are the basic features which are essentially important, okay? So the question is, okay, um, agar aap, uh, if you want to use deep neural networks to be able to compress data, what would be the appropriate architecture to be able to design something like that? Okay. So uh, before we actually look at autoencoders, let's try to see okay, what are diff different ways in one, one can think of that you can actually use to compress data. So what happens when you typically compress data? What kind of algorithms are you using? Um, so is it always um, is it always lossy compression or is it lossless compression? compression For example, you might have zipped your file and you've sent it to me, so on, right? So that's a compression technique. But when you zip something, is it lossy or is it lossless? It's lossless, right? Hopefully. Otherwise, it'll be a problem because I won't be able to see what you actually wrote in your code. Um, but still kind of compressed. Um, now, what about examples of lossy compression? Image compression, right? So typically when you compress an image, for example, if you're uploading it onto Facebook or something, it doesn't always get compressed. It always asks you the original size or you know, a reduced size and so on. So that's, uh, if you're doing the original size, it will probably still be compressed, but it won't be lossy. But if you're trying to reduce the size, then it will naturally be lossy, okay? So if you're using deep neural networks, can you think of an architecture by which one could actually achieve compression? And what would compression be like when you are, let's say if you're taking an image and you're trying to compress it, so you have, you have some kind of an image, right? And you're trying to compress it, okay? So here's an image of a person and you're trying to compress it. So um, how, what would be the traditional algorithms which try to compress this? Uh, you must have, sorry? So yes, Max Pulling, so you've already seen something like that. So you could do, uh, if you're using uh, deep neural networks, you could use max pooling, that's a great idea. You could do it and you would actually compress it if it's a two by two filter, then you're basically reducing it to half the size, okay? Um, what other ways could you do it? So one way is that you take your input and you apply a whole bunch of max pooling, okay? And so you've got an image which is compressed, okay? Now, um, what it tries to do is it tries to, uh, so, so when you're compressing it, the question is in deep neural networks, let's say if you have an X and if you have an output Y, how would you, um, so if you're doing simply max pooling, um, how do you train the neural network? Um, earlier when you were doing it, what, what were you using? What was the general algorithm? When we are applying max pooling, how, how are we training the network? Back propagation, back propagation relied on what? On the gradient descent, but it relied on some output. So I, lab, I called it y hat, which was the label data. 
and y was the output, and it did a comparison between y and y hat, right? So um, there was some kind of a mean square error or something like that. There was some kind of a compression comparison, right? But in this case, um, what was y hat? When we when we're doing max pooling for doing compression, uh, what what was the, how was the loss calculated? We we were either applying the regression or we were doing classification, right? So when you were doing classification, you had label data and you knew that this particular image was either a frog or a deer or whatever, and you had that data and that's how you, you trained your network, right? Now if you simply, and if you had regression, you had similar kind of a label data. Now if you're trying to do compression, how would you, what would be a loss equation? If you're trying to use a neural network for compression, let's say max pooling is the right? You've compressed it down. Now, how do we, how do we, uh, what is the loss equation in that case? What do you want to compare it against? When you're doing, when you're doing any kind of compression, right? What do you do? You compress it and then you decompress it, right? You have some kind of a decompression algorithm which decompresses it. So it brings it back to the original size. So it, let's say you had a, a thousand by thousand image, you compressed it down and it was becoming, let's say 500 by 500 or 100 by 100, but you want to see the original image in its original size, right? So you convert it from a thousand by a thousand to let's say 100 by 100. And then you would want to decompress it back to thousand by thousand, right? Sorry. And then how would you, uh, if you de once you decompress it, where, what, what would your loss equation be? How do, you, how, do you how do you find out how good is the compression algorithm? Sorry? Original basic compress, compare can organize. Because then basically what you need to do, you want to see how, if you want to be able to see how good is the compression algorithm, you want to be able to compare it with the original equation, original image, okay? And if this Y comes out to be very close to the original image, even after doing a compression, then you would say it's very good. So what would Y hat be? What would you, what would your label data be in this case? Sorry? The, the original thousand by thousand image. So this would actually be, if this is X and this is Y, the output, okay? Your original, your the comparison would be against X, okay? And so um, what we're doing now is basically we, we're calculating Y based on decompression, okay? So we're going to decompress it. So in a deep neural network, when you're compressing it, you're trying to figure out what weights to use and you're trying to compress it. So if you're trying to compress it, you're trying to basically reduce the number of features, right? So let's say you started off by a large number of features. You want to be able to compress it so that the number of features, the important features become, are, are left, the unimportant features are left out, okay? So if you think about it, basically what you're doing is you're taking your input X, okay? And then what you might want to do is you might want to use a series of uh, deep layers or hidden layers, and each one of them would be of size would be smaller, right? You want to eventually compress this to something small, and then you want to be able to decompress this, okay? So you would start to decompress this by using sort of a symmetric output, okay? So this could be your what is typically called the encoding process, encoding, and this would be the decoding part. All right, and the, the output that you get Y would have to be compared against the original input X. So you would be comparing Y, instead of by Y hat, you'd be comparing it with X, okay? Now, what kind of, uh, a uh, loss equation could you use? Would you use something which was similar to classification or mean squared error loss? 
Would be similar to regression, or it be similar to classification? Would be similar to regression, right? Because now you're doing a dot by a, a point to point comparison. You're comparing every pixel at the output with the every pixel at the input and trying to see how close is it. Okay, so you would probably do something like a mean squared error. Okay, so mean squared error would be summation of let's say y minus x. Okay, and you do a summation over i i is equal to one to n, and you divide that by n. Okay, so something like that, you do a mean squared error. So this is basically what an autoencoder is, okay? So if you look at this, uh, this is what it looks like. Um, D. Sorry? Can you say again, it was much open? So it depends. It depends on what kind, you could compress it extremely uh, a lot. Okay, you can take a thousand by thousand image, compress it to a two by two <laughs> pixel, right? But when you de decompress it, what's going to happen? Huge loss, right? So it depends on how, how lossy you want it. So if, for example, you compressed it, in this particular case, it's called a 2D because you basically compressed it to two dimensions over here. You, you've, got, you, you've taken a large input, and you've compressed it down to uh, two, two dimensions only. In other words, you've only got two variables left, okay? You could have, instead of 2D, you could have 20D over here, okay? So that will result in a different loss. So we've already talked about the loss. You have the encoder network, you have the decoder network. The depth of this could be varying. So it could be, you know, single uh, hidden layer, it could be 100 hidden layers, okay? Uh, this could also be, so if you're taking an image, uh, what kind of uh, properties do you think this this would would it be a simple uh, fully connected network or what would it be like? If if you're trying to compress an image, what kind of a network do you think it would be over here? Sorry. How do you how do you when you classifying an image do you use your what kind of a, uh, layers do you use? Sorry, fully connected, pura hota hai? kafi din time lagaya about convolution, right? So it's not necessarily going to be just a fully connected because sometimes you do fully connected, but you've also got convolution layers, okay? So if you've got an image that you're trying to compress, you might have a mixture of CNN and you know fully connected layers, okay? If it's something else, for example, if it's not nothing related to images, uh, you know, the original data that we looked at, uh, then it, it doesn't have to be for, uh, convolution, okay? If it's um, data which has time, then what do you think it will have? If, if So then it will have something like an LSTM there, okay? So depending on what kind of input you're giving in, the, the, the encoding layers would be correspondingly similar, would, would be corresponding. So they can jump be whenever you have a deep neural network, there has to be learning, right? Because initially, this particular network is go essentially what you're doing is you're designing an architecture, right? In the architecture, what you're saying is you have a certain number of inputs over here. Um, sorry, you have these inputs over here, okay? The outputs, as we said, are going to basically be this is why, and the outputs are going to be compared with the input. Okay, so you got, the loss is going to be um, x prime, or you can call this y. Basically, it's going to be y minus x. Okay, so it's going to be some kind of a comparison over here. It could be a, 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 a for example, a mean squared error. So once you've defined the loss and you've defined the architecture, now in the architecture, you might have, for example, in this particular case, you've got two hidden layers. Okay. Uh, this, the number of layers is going to keep on decreasing. The number of the width of the layers is going to keep on decreasing, right? So these two layers are both three and three, but now you notice that this is only two layers, okay? So the number of weights is now decreasing. So it's basically trying to figure out what are the important, uh, important uh, features, 
okay, that need to be memorized, that need to be remembered in order to create the best original image. Okay. So, um, and then you're going to have a D encoder network. And the D encoder network is again, generally is similar, is, uh, you know, it's, uh, um, it's symmetrical. So if it's, this is two layered, this will be two layered as well. If it's fully connected, it's going to be fully connected. If it's a CNN, then it's probably going to be a completely symmetric network on the decoding side. Okay. So aapka jo sawal tha, uh, did I answer that? But now the question is, how are you going to train the weights? The weights are going to be trained by calculating loss and the loss is going to be comparing the original image with the output. So initially when you do this compression, uh, you might be generating an input, which is a cat and the output would be completely garbage, right? Uh, so, so the idea was that I said, and we, I think you missed the earlier part, is that the idea, the objective is to compress the data, okay? Now the question is why? Okay, so maybe I didn't talk about that. What are the typical reasons why you compress data? It's easier to communicate, right? So uh, for example, if you want to send the data to a friend, you want to compress it, and then on your mobile phone, when you, you receive the data, you want to decompress it, right? So that's, so this is, the, all those examples are applied over here, okay? But there are more examples as we'll see. The most obvious is that you want to compress it simply because you want to communicate it or you want to store it and you, do, you want to store it and you want to communicate it using less data, okay? But we'll see lots of other examples uh, which are very unique to deep neural networks, okay? And those are applications of autoencoders. So, um, so basically the idea here is that we want to compress it. Uh, we, you get the idea that we're going to compare it with the original data, and that's how we're going to calculate the, grade, the, the loss. Once you've calculated the loss, we'll use the traditional you know, backpropagation algorithms to be able to calculate the gradients, and that's how we'll train, okay? So far, this is still, uh, is it supervised or unsupervised? Hmm. Good. It's actually unsupervised, why? Why, because nobody's actually labeled the data. There's no labeling on. All you're taking, you could take a million images from the internet and all it's going to do is going to re try to recreate the original million images. Nobody's actually tried to figure out in the class classifications, label nothing like that. All it's trying to do is trying to regenerate the input data. So it's unsupervised data, okay? So it's very easy to get the data. It's very easy to uh, train this network as long as you have computing power, okay? Now, G? So normal compression can be compared to Kasa Hoga. So let's take a look at some examples, okay? Here are some examples of this. Um, this is a 2D latent space. In other words, latent space is basically how many hidden variables you have, okay? So here, uh, they're not really specifying, I haven't looked at the details, but basically this is a 2D versus a 5D, okay? So in terms of the number of variables, this has five, as five times as many as compared, this has five over two times as many variables over here, okay? Now, if you look at the input image, what they've done is basically taken the MNIST data set, Remember what the MNIST data set was, right? MNIST was basically handwritten images. And basically um, what this particular example has done is taken the MNIST data and it's trained it on itself, unsupervised. And the idea is that can you uh, recreate the original images, okay? Now it's very interesting as to what is actually learned. Now if you do a typical compression, um, you, the compressed image may have absolutely no relevance to the original image, okay? But guess what, what, when you do deep neural networks, guess what is actually the compressed image? From what you've actually learned, you've seen that uh, deep neural networks try to, basically try to learn a simpler version of the image, okay? So if you have these digits and these digits are between zero and nine, okay? So there are only nine, only 10 types of images that exist. And you're trying to, um, you're trying to compress it into something very simple. Now these, if you look at this, the original seven could be written in hundreds of ways, right? 
Somebody would write it like this, somebody would write it like that, somebody might write it like this, right? But there is a basic inherent feature which basically says this is a seven, right? And what the deep neural network tries to do, if you try to compress it, it tries to learn what is the essence of a seven, okay? And what it will learn is that it is supposed to look something like this. On average, it will learn that if it is a seven, this is what a seven is supposed to be, okay? So if you try to compress it into something like a 10D, okay? So it should be able to learn the basic 10 versions of the, of the digits, okay? So it's, some, it's learning a simpler uh, uh, version of the, of the digits. Now, if you similarly, if you were training uh, A to Z, right? A select a Z tuck, uh, what do you think would be uh, an appropriate size of the, of this is referred to as the bottleneck by the way, okay? So this here is the bottleneck. This is the encoder, this is the decoder. So the, the bottleneck has to be of an appropriate size. So if you're learning the alphabets A to Z in the uppercase, then what should be the appropriate size of the, of the bottleneck? It should be 26 because you can see that if you want to basically learn the essence of the alphabets, you should be able to learn 26 different versions of the alphabets, right? So this is simply showing you um, what the compression would look like. So if you do a 2D compression, if you convert it into only two uh, uh, latent space, then the output looks a little vague, okay? So this is the reconstruction. If after you've done a bottleneck of a 5D, then obviously you are compressing it less, okay? The bottleneck is a little bit wider. So the, the decompressed uh, image set, the image looks a little bit more like the original. There's less loss, okay? So if you look at the seven over here and you look at the seven over here, they look similar. As compared to the seven over here, you can see that it's a little bit more fuzzy, okay? So um, this is an example of, uh, this is one example. Now here's another example. Okay, and this is uh, again used in image segmentation. So image segmentation is uh, a different area of, of neural, deep neural networks of image recognition. And basically this is widely used. There are a lot of algorithms which are used, but one of the algorithms which has become popular is to use autoencoders, okay? And what they do is they try to basically compress, they're using a compression algorithm over here, okay? And this is again based on your typical CNN architectures. You have CNN, you've got Max pooling, you've got, uh, you know, um, all of that. And then you try to compress into a very simple image. And then you try to select uh, an output which is based on uh, a classification. And you're trying to basically classify it into one of all possible classifications that you might want to have. So for example, if you're using this for, um, you know, uh, recognizing or be, being able to have self-driving. So in self-driving, Basically, what you want to do is you want to be able to figure out what are the classes, right? So you want to be able to say that these are all the, the cars, okay? This is the portion which is the sky. These are the buildings. There are some buildings over here. There are some road markings. Each one of these has its own importance, okay? If there's a pole over there, there's a tree over there, you, you want to make sure you don't bump into that, right? But if it is a road marking, then it's okay to go over it. Each one of them has their own, it's, it's their own, importance when you're trying to do self-driving. So this is often used in image segmentation. I'm not going over the details of how it's actually done. This is a lot more complex than what appears to be. But what all I'm saying is that it is using a compression algorithm and you can see why compression is useful. Why do you think compressing it and decompressing it is, is being, how is that being utilized in image segmentation? So you've got a very complex image, right? You're compressing it into a very simple image, okay? And that image is now basically saying, it's, it's taking all of these cars and it's saying, it's trying to figure out what class of category is this, okay? So it's taking all of these different cars and it's saying that these are all of category of, of cars. But of course, is this completely unsupervised or does this require supervision? it will be supervised, right? So somebody will actually have to figure out that once it's done all of this classification, it'll have, somebody will actually have to figure out that this car is, this shape is, and this is of, 
of type car. Okay, so this is not um, unsupervised portion. So it's a combination. At times you will see audio encoders are being used completely unsupervised. At times they'll be used in supervised learning, or it could be a mixture as well. Okay, G. So dekhe, yaha par bottleneck kya hai? Yaha par you basically trying to convert it into a set of maybe you know 10 or 100 classes. Okay, so that's your bottleneck. You're trying to learn the basic aspect. So we don't really need to need, see the bushes in detail. We can forget about how a bush looks like, but all we're trying to do is compress it into its basic form, which is basically, it's basically a tree, okay? We're trying to take a car in all its different forms and we're trying to classify the most essential part of it. And we're trying to say that in basically it's a, it's a class of a, of a particular class. So by, by compressing this, you are essentially trying to figure out what is the most the essential part of this image you know, for each one of these aspects of the image. Okay. So without going to a lot of a lot more detail, this is just to show you that this is not what the, the normal uh, compression does, right? Have you ever seen a normal compression of an image which can result in image segmentation? Absolutely not, right? So both of these examples are very unique. Uh, well, this is not so unique right now because we haven't really studied this. But this is a very unique example of how when you're doing image compression using deep neural networks, you can get a lot more than you, what you can in a normal compression. Okay, so this is extremely powerful. Now, here's another example. Uh, this is what is referred to as a denoising autoencoder. Okay, so the idea is that you have an image, okay, and you're trying to figure out uh, what are these? So we know that we can look at it and we can say that this is supposed to be a seven, this is supposed to be a two, this is one, and this is a zero, right? But how do you train, uh, how, uh, how can you train it to be able to figure out these images, these, the, the digits, okay? Now, if any of you have studied um, classical um, uh, ways of actually Denoising. I don't know if anybody has studied that. So, uh, this, so you could do you could do it by using various filters. So remember when they talked about filters, what were they doing? If you used a mean, if you used an averaging filter, we saw that averaging filter. What would it do? It would take this, and it would probably result in a zero, but it wouldn't convert it into completely black black over here. Okay, why? Because it would basically say that there is a mixture of white and black, and it would probably result in some kind of a gray image in the background, okay? So by averaging it out, uh, by simply applying an averaging CNN filter, it won't probably do a very good job, okay? What else could we do? There's a Gaussian filter, okay? So in a Gaussian filter, basically what you're doing is you're using something like this, and you're saying that you, you apply a Gaussian filter over here, and you say that um, what is the, um, uh, you know, you, you, well, I don't exactly remember how the Gaussian filter lo looks like, but it does an averaging, okay? And it would average it based on the distance. So if the white was very far and most of this was black, it would probably result in a stronger black, okay? So these are techniques which have been traditionally used and they're very good. I'm not saying that they're bad but they have to be compared with deep neural networks and try to see which are better. So now what deep neural networks is going to do, guess how it's going to do it now. First of all, can you imagine how you're going to train this network? So first of all, are you going to use, um, are you going to use an autoencoder or do you need to use an autoencoder or not? Or are you or technique bata rahe hain, kya karenge? Okay, so you take a CNN layer, okay? And you take a bunch of CNN layers, right? And at the end, you have an output, which is going to be what? So what are we doing? Classification, regression, what are we doing? Uh, are, are we doing re-auto-encoders? Uh, auto are we trying to re, re, recreate it, okay? So let's say we're trying to recreate it. So if you recreate it, then hopefully you're going to try to compress it initially, okay? So you have compression, 
and then you're going to uncompress it and you get an output. Um, so now how do we train this? Uh, what are we trying to achieve? How to encode is optimal, Karam. So now tell me, keep going. What's the, what's the loss equation? How do we calculate the loss? What are we comparing it with? So you've got X and the output is Y. So you're trying to come, so you're going to compare it to the original image. Okay, very good. So you, you're on the right track. So you're doing an auto encoder. Up X me kya de rahe? So the loss is going to be uh, Y minus X, right? Some function of Y minus X. What is the X? Is it going to be this? Or is it going to be this? Or what is it going to be? D is going to be the correct image. We, we're trying to create, we're trying to create an, um, first we're going to try to train the network. There are two stages to it. So in the first stage, we're trying to do the training and then we're going to apply a particular image that we want to denoise. Okay, so we haven't got to the second stage yet. First, we need to train it. So the, my question is, if you to train it, then how will you train it? So you clear image, denge, so you will give it a bunch of MNIST data, which is very clean, okay? And you try to create the original image, okay? And so now it knows that, um, it knows how to compress this data into very simple form. Okay, now when you give, going to give it, so this is fine. Now you're going to give it a test data. The test data, the, sorry, this is the, now the validation data, right? So the validation job, validation test data. So this was the training. You trained it on the original data. Okay, original. And now you're going to test it. Um, and you're going to test it on, let's say a noisy, data. So this is the test. Okay. And your training was based on this. Now, when you give it this, um, what are we going to expect out at the output? So we, we, when we gave it this, we were able to reconstruct the original image, right? But the training was done on clean data. And it learned, it, it somehow learned what the internal representation was and was able to recreate it, right? Now what, you, now what you're giving it is when you're testing it, you're giving it a noisy data, okay? You think it's going to be able to create the output, the original output. When you give it this particular O, noisy O, will it be able to create the original output? Sorry? So, aapka output aa gaya. Ab aapne train kar liya. Train khatam ho gaya. Right? Ab now you're going to actually give it uh, a particular O which is noisy. What do you expect? You expect that it will, it should give you this, right? Okay. So, this is, looks, looks all right. But let me give you an alternate hypothesis and tell me which one will be better, okay? The alternate hypothesis is that instead of training it on this data, I train it on this data, okay? So the X that I'm going to give it is let's say X noisy. I'm going to call it XN, sorry, XN over here, okay? And now I want, to be able to, so this is the training phase now. I'm, I'm training it on the noisy data. I'm giving it input as the noisy data, but I want to create the loss equation. Now, what should I give it as the loss equation? What should I compare it with? F of Y minus XN. Let's call this X and this is X noisy, right? So this is XO, this original data. Should we compare it with XN or XO? Clearly XO, right? So you've got two architectures. In the first architecture, we gave the input XO, and this is what we did. In the second architecture, we gave it XN, 
and we also did the same function. So we applied the same algorithm, but the difference was in the first architecture, let's say the architecture A and architecture B, in A, your proposal was that we give it the original data and we calculate the loss against the original data. In architecture B, we gave it the noisy data. Uh, sorry, I got this the other way around. So this was uh, B and this was your original A, right? So this is what we said initially, that you gave it the original data as the input and you use this loss equation. The loss equation is always going to be the same. The main question is, should we give it the original data for training or should we give it the lossy, the lossy images, the noisy images for training? And, do you, and which do you think is going to result in a better architecture? Sorry? So, so basically the question is, should we train with the original data or train with the no noisy data? Train with the original data is your original proposal and train with the noisy, which is my proposal, is B, um, just an alternate. I'm not saying it's better or, or, or worse. It could actually be worse. But I'm saying, K, should we train with the noisy data or should we train with the original data? Uh, I think, sir, we should train with the noisy just, data. Just hold on a second. Uh, up, go on that... and just wait because somebody is speaking locally. G. Okay. Yeah. Loss is clear because what is the output? It has to be compared with the clean data. Uh, why would it be better in terms of the uh, training? So, so in the in the yeah the final loss is compared with the the correct data, right? Yeah. So. I understand what you're saying, but what's your final, what are you concluding? B, B would be better because, right, right. Why we still haven't made the argument? Why is it? Why is, will it be better? Yeah. 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 Okay, but you still haven't made a very clear argument. Uh, uh, online, somebody was making, was saying something. So let me see who's speaking. Yeah, it's Aftab Khalil. Sir, I was saying that we should go approach B. We should use the noisy data. Because we want to achieve the objective, that we want to achieve the noisy data, that we want to convert the noisy data to non-noisy data. So it's necessary to use the noisy data for training. Okay, but that's the thing that you should use the noisy data for training. Okay, so that's a good argument. Basically, Aftab is saying, that if we if we are if we're using the noisy image for the training purposes, and I think that's what you're saying, is that uh, we're saying that when you have a noisy data, how do we find how do we correct it? That was maybe what you were also trying to say. Okay, so you start because when you're going to be you're going to be testing it, you're not going to be giving it a clean image. You're going to be giving it a, a, a noisy image. So how do you go from a noisy image to a clean image? So, so basically that's the argument that to be able to, to train it, you need to actually give it the noisy image, okay? 
The loss equation, however, has to be compared with the correct, with the, uh, the non-noise image, okay? So this is basically a whole class of algorithms which is going to use this technique that whenever you have something which is not desirable, but you want to get to a desirable state, you train based on the, 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 the data that you're going to be typically getting, which could be corrupted data, which could have some, all kinds of problems, but you want to have the lossy equation to compare it with the correct data, okay? So guess how they, they would, so if you want to be able to decipher handwritten digits from noisy, how would you go about training it? Sorry? Uh, so, so practically, so let's say you want to train it for, uh, you know, you, you're getting, you know, that when you look at images coming on TV, you have a lot of noise, right? There's dots all over the place, white noise or something like that. So suppose that you're getting these images and you're taking a picture on TV and you, you're trying to figure out that, that it's a one or zero. These are maybe voting count in some, some elections or something. And you have all kind of a grainy image. So how would you actually, so your task is as a, you know, expert in this machine learning is to be able to be able to make a machine learning, uh, you know, come up with a deep neural network, which is already pre-trained. So where would you, how would you train it? Where would you get all, how would you go about it? You've got MNIST, which is completely clear. That's available. Noises add cutting it, right? So in order to be able to train, to be able to denoise it, to make a, a good deep neural network which can denoise, first what you'll do is you will introduce noise into the MNIST data set. And you will introduce the kind of noise that you want to denoise from, right? So if you want to denoise from this kind of uh, no, noise which are random in nature, which might be called white noise or something like that, then you introduce that into the MNIST data set and you use that to create the X, N, and then you use this to train your data. And after you've done a large number of training, you'll hopefully have a nice uh, DNN, an autoencoder DNN, which should be ready to denoise based on that specific type of noise. Sorry, ah, salt and pepper, very good. So this is an example of salt and pepper because salt is white and pepper is black. So it's, it's uh, black and white noise. Okay, it's like, you know, you put salt and pepper on top of the image. So uh, this particular example is used a lot. So this is where you see what you see, that what you're doing is you're taking the number two, you're taking the MNIST data set, you're adding the noise, okay? You're creating an artificially corrupted data set. You're using it to encode and you have a compressed uh, representation, you decode, and then you compare this to the original data. Reconstruction losses, how well can the output Y be reconstructed to the original, okay? Not, of course, with this, because that won't get you anywhere. So this was the basic architecture. Now let's take a look at some other examples. And this was some uh, sample, this is the actual output. So you can see that uh, this seven, when it was corrupted, it noisy, then it got back. So this is actual data, which you can see is, becomes quite good, okay? Ajit. Hmm. Hmm. Hmm, right. Right, so suppose that you, uh, you use a compression, which is ultimately converting into very basic 10, um, you know, it's a 10D. So that there are only 10 uh, uh, features which are kept. So hopefully it will take something which looks like a combination, uh, you know, some of people like write it like this, some people write it like this, some people write it like this. It will hopefully take the one which is most, you know, most representative of the seven, okay? I don't know if I have that over here, but um, I had an example of, no, I don't have that, but I'll try to show you later, is that basically what you see after you've, um, 
after if you look at if let's say if you don't use 10d if you use a uh, uh, 100 okay so what you'll see is that the compressed image the, the ultimate compressed image will have all the typical ways in which you write seven okay so it might uh, it might have seven like this it might have seven like this it might have seven like this and so on okay so if you're using for example 10 ways to record a seven so you'll see all the most typical ways that seven is written okay so I hope that gives you an idea. And if you try to compress it to, instead of 100D, you try to compress it to 10D, you'll see one of those uh, forms to be selected, which is most uh, representative. Okay. Uh, it, it'll depend on um, how, how, um, how much compression you're applying. Now let's take a look at another example. So this is somewhat simpler, similar. It's called neural in-painting, okay? So um, the issue is that in some images, you may not have, have salt and pepper, but you might have a complete portion of that image which is completely missed out, right? It could be because, you know, something came in the middle, right? There was some obstruction and you, you took a picture and you're trying to recreate it, okay? So this is a little bit, bit more tricky, right? Now the question is, how would you train this? what would be the process of training such images if you want to train it, not for salt and pepper, but now you want to train it for in painting, which is basically a complete portion of the, of the image may be uh, missing because of that say square, you know, it's, it's got a portion which is square, which is missing, okay? So how would you go about training it and would, what technique would you use? Presumably we, Going to use autoencoders because that's the topic we're on, right? So you use an autoencoder, all right? You do compression, you'd come back with this. Uh, what would you train? How would you do the training? What would you use as the input? So let's say this was your original X out. This was original. This is your noisy image, and this is your output. You're going to presumably compare it with. So, so now the, the point is that there are two stages, right? There's a training stage, training stage, and there is the testing stage. Now, these are all examples of where you're testing it, but it hasn't shown you how you're training it. So the question is, how would you train this? So what, how would you create the noise image? Jeel, how about you? Sorry? Uh, so, so give me an example. I want, I want to train your random images, right? I ask you to do this. So, wh where, how will you get the, the x, n that you want to train on, right? The noisy image. How would you get that? So, you take. Let's say you take a million images from the internet, just random images, okay? And then what? Because you want to re be able to reconstruct something which has a square in the middle of a certain size missing. So you would introduce squares inside the images, right? So every image that you took, so again, is this, um, is this supervised or unsupervised? Is it supervised or unsupervised? So what we're doing is we're taking, taking an image, we're creating, we, we're cropping out a certain portion of that image, right? And now we are training it. So is it supervised or unsupervised? Is a mix. Are you doing any labeling? Is anybody doing any labeling? No, so it is unsupervised. All you're doing is you messing with the image. You're taking an image, you're doing a random portion of it. You're cropping it out. It doesn't require anybody to actually label, do any, no humans are involved. It could be a random algorithm which just takes a random portion of, the, of that image, crops it out, right? Maybe it puts uh, all zeros over there or all ones or whatever, right? It just banks it out or maybe puts a a pink uh, square over there. And then you're going to compare it with the original image, okay? You're going to do that with perhaps millions of images that are already available on the internet, okay? No labeling required. And then once you've trained this to be able to take a portion of that image and replace that with the original image, then you introduce something like this, okay? This is now the test. So guess what it gives you? This is the actual results. 
and see how accurately it's being able to do that. So it's, why do you think it's been able to figure out that um, this portion should be like this? How do you think it's figured it out? You know, it's very accurate. So it's figured out that it's, it's not a very clean image. It's a, you know, slightly ruffled. And then it's fi figured out that the stick over here, all of this was missing, right? So it figured out that there was supposed to be a stick going across. How do you think it figured it out? It probably saw a lot of images in which there was a very sharp kind of an image, right? If you saw a stick and you removed a portion of it, it could figure out that the middle portion, generally that there was continuity, okay? So it's learned that when you have an object like this, and if it's going like this, because it was probably trained on a lot of data which had branches, right? So if you've trained enough branches, you know that if you remove a portion of it, the middle portion will actually be continuity and it will have a slight curvature as well. And it should eventually the edges should join up, okay? So imagine the kind of learning that's going on simply because you are training it with the right type of, uh, you know, um, you know, the right type of noisy data. Now, if you had trained this with salt and pepper data, do you think it would have been able to do it? No, probably not, because that was a different type of training. Here, a portion of the image was removed, and so you, it was a different kind of a training, all right? So similarly, now you see that it doesn't always work. Look at this image. Has this, has this messed up over here? So it's not always perfect. Okay, why is this messed up? Because now you can see the sky through the parrot's body. So it's not always going to be perfect. Okay, it somehow figured out that here bushes were, so bushes and sky were, so it made bushes and sky go ahead. Because why? Because probably the the body of the parrot was not very visible. Here, see, the body of the of the eagle was fairly visible. There was a very clear, stark comparison between the sky and the and the body of the of the eagle or the kite. And so it could figure out that this is how most birds are. They've got slightly ruffled feathers and this is what a typical bird is. And it was able to figure that out. But because this was slightly hidden by the bushes, it got confused. And it actually created a sky image right through the parrot, which obviously is not right, okay? But look at this portion. Uh, it was able to take a, you know, a, a, a fountain, and it was able to at least create an image which looks like a fountain. It was not as realistic maybe, but it was able to do that. Similarly, if you look at this portion over here, it has continuity of the wall. You notice this. It didn't know that this wall was going down, right? But it has been able to see that it was able to continue the sky over here all the way to the ground. It is able to create these images. So it, it's quite powerful. I mean, no compression algorithm normally would have been able to do this, right? So this is the kind of thing that you can do in deep neural networks. So here it was fairly good. Why? Because, uh, you know, it, the, you can figure it out, right? The, the bushes were in front of, the, of this particular bird and it was able to create a sort of an, an image which looked quite realistic. Okay. So you're getting the, 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 kind, the kind of power that deep neural networks has in recreating images, okay? Yes. Not only what we have seen, but the kind of the kind of noise it's been trained on, it can overcome that kind of noise. So if it was trained on salt and pepper noise, it is able to overcome that. If it's trained on a that cropping of an image, I'll give you another example over here, okay? So. Um, so this is again the same thing. Basically what it's saying is that you're using some kind of a mean squared error or you could be using a binary cross entropy for training it. You're again going through a narrow, for example, the, the width over here is 16. It started off with a width of 128. It came down using different convolution layers. And then it, it the input was a noisy image, but it's doing a comparison between the output and the original image. Take it up. So uh, here's some other examples. So for example, removing watermarks, okay? Now the question is, how would you train this? So if you notice that 
this image does not have the watermarks over here, okay? You can see these watermarks over here are no longer there in this image, right? So if you want to train it to remove watermarks, what would you do? You would take the normal image and you try to train it on a lot of watermarks, right? You'd introduce that, that would be the corrupted image, uh, calculate the loss on the original image and hopefully it would be trained to remove watermarks. Yes, that's the whole idea. But it depends on what, how much data you used for training, right? So if you've only trained it on lions, it will not be able to, to uh, work very well on a bird because those are very different things. But if you've trained it on all kinds of images, and because this does not require a lot of super, supervision, it becomes very easy because the most difficult part of, of all of these algorithms in machine learning is to be able to provide the labeling. Okay, labeling is extremely expensive. Imagine that a human being has to be involved to actually label data. This is, that's not required over here. All you need to do is take a million images, write an algorithm which creates random noise, any kind of noise that you want, you create it automatically, it just has to run through it and it, you compare it with the original image, right? But if you want to make it very uh, you know, gener general, then you've got to give it all kinds of images. And there are lots of, you know, the ImageNet data set has, I don't know how, many, how much data, but it's got huge amount of data. So you could just take that data set and train it on that. And that's got pretty much all kinds of data in it. Hmm. So, cat is the that the cat is uh, considered as an animal. And because the cat is 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 so if you want to be, so I haven't looked at it in that much detail, but let's say from what you're saying that it's got, a, let's say a, a cat family. And then above that, it's, you know, if you look at the, the hierarchy, family patterns, eh? Huh, so, so it depends on what you're trying to do. So right now what we're talking about is autoencoders. Autoencoders, do you need to have any classification? No. All you need to know is how to create from the from a noisy data, the original data. So if the image net is huge and you don't really care about the classification, all you need to do is take that data, corrupt it in the way you want to and compare it to the original image. In this? Yeah. Okay. Okay, okay. So you you're changing the problem, right? Now let's say that I, all I want is I take an image and I want to compress, I want to denoise it, okay? Do I really want to, do you want to, are you, are you, who's going to decide what the problem is? You, the engineer, right? The computer scientist or the client? The client, right? You're going to go to a client and you say, I'm a machine learning expert, what's your problem? The, the guy will say, I don't want to classify. All I want to do is I want to denoise this. Hmm. Achha, so you're saying that, okay, so you're saying that, um, I got your point. What you're trying to do is, if we introduce classification, then can we improve the uh, output? Okay, so that's a different point. Yes, I, I didn't understand your point. Uh, us perspective, mein job kare, phir toh idea. Uh. Hmm. So then if you, for example, if you want to do that, then it becomes a bit more complicated. You've got a good idea, very good idea. So in other words, if you wanted to use an autoencoder along with the classification and use that combination to denoise, that's a fantastic idea. Because now what you're doing is, you know that it is a lion, so it is a cat family, so it's probably got a smooth edge, right? You are, uh, if you know that this is, so what you're doing is basically you're combining different features. We, for example, have throw the image segmentation, right? If you have image segmentation, kar le, or if you have image, each image, when, once you've segmented, you've classified it, and it becomes more powerful. 
You're absolutely right. You could apply different combinations of these techniques. Abhi to hum each technique ko alag alag padhe na. But if you want to make something more powerful, and this is what is typically done, you combine various uh, compo- various types of uh, deep neural networks, and you combining you combine it in different ways, and that's where you come up with a new architecture. So if you want to use that in your project, that's a fantastic idea. You you could say that okay, I'm going to take auto encoders and I'm going to combine it with some other classification technique or maybe image or maybe some kind of image segmentation technique and let's see what the results are and you could this could be a phd thesis actually okay if other people have not already used it uh, but my the chances are that other people probably have used this method but maybe you can come up with a slight twist on what is what is being done okay but great idea okay so um so that was all about auto encoders okay uh let's see how we doing with time so we have another 10 minutes by the way next week says since because uh maghrib is now a little bit early so i'd like to start a little early and finish early is that okay start at 6 and finish quarter to 9 so we can get home early 15 and paunchne mein okay so officially it's supposed to be 6:15 I won't change it unless everybody agrees. So if somebody has a problem, I won't change it. Okay, tell him we'll keep it at six fifteen. That's fine. Um, so um, so we've got another ten minutes. So let's now talk about the next topic, which is related to auto encoders, but it's called variational auto encoders. Okay. Now the concept here is that you take auto encoders. but now you include what is called a uh, stochasticity or probability to put in simple terms so what we want to do is not train uh, the date train on the original image but now the concept is slightly different now instead of taking the original image for training we want to have a distribution of the image and train based on that okay so what do i mean by that uh, okay. let's say okay um, you are training again let's say you training on people right and um, you you've got a lot of original images what you could do but what you could do is and the reason why we want to do this is now sort of leads us towards gans okay because we want to be able to generate something which does not exist before okay so when you want to let's say you want to create a new face okay so here is a, a face all right um and you want to be able to create a new face okay now if you train it on the original data will it be able to create a completely new human face which doesn't hasn't existed you know all the 7 8 billion people on this planet it's you know each one of us are somehow unique it's amazing allah taala ki qudrat hai ke each one of us d- despite the fact that you know there are so many people each one of us has a absolutely unique face but some of people look similar very similar at times but still if you look very closely at them i'm sure for us all chinese people look similar but for chinese uh, each one of them looks different similarly like for us each one of us we can uh, figure out the differences so there are small differences now the question is if you take faces and this is a very popular area of gans where you know you can see that a large number of faces you know artificial faces are created for what purpose abhi to it's a little bit dicey whether those that's a good objective or not it's we misuse a lot as well but uh, the question is if this and i'm sure there are lots of good reasons why people want to do this as well so if you want to create a face an absolutely new face so what would you want to do you don't want to train based on existing data okay because if you simply train it based on the existing data it would be able to recreate an existing image okay but what if you trained it on the distribution of that data okay in other words uh you've got let's say a nose right you want to be able to figure out you know there's all kinds of noses there's people like this is like this all kinds of noses right so you want to be able to take all of this data 
and to be able to create a distribution, right? So all of you have studied distribution, so we know that you will come up with a mean value, okay? So it could be a mean plus a standard deviation, all right? So you could have a mean of the value. So this, let's say this is the uh, length of the nose, right? So this is the length of the nose, and this is the mean, let's say it's two, uh, two centimeters, okay? This is the average, but some people have, uh, this is two centimeters, sorry, over here, but some people might have 1.5 centimeters as well, right? So this is a distribution of the size of the length of the nose, okay? If you can figure this out, and if you want to create a new nose, if you want to create a new human uh, face, then what we can do is figure out this distribution and then take a random value from this distribution, okay? So suppose that all of the human beings have one of these distributions, right? So let's say you've taken data from 10 people. Let's make it simple. Let's say you've taken data from three people, right? So you've got one person over here, which has, uh, let's say two centimeters, another person who's got 2.1 centimeters, another person who's got 1.9 centimeters, right? But now we've got some idea of the distribution, right? Now if you want to create a new nose, and if you took a, a, a sample from this distribution, would it be identical to the, any one of the existing three? Right? Would it be identical to one of them? You're taking a sample from this. So it would draw a sample from this data, from this distribution. That sample would most likely be somewhere over here because that's the mean, okay? But it could be a uh, random value. So it could be something an extreme as well. So you could come up, if you created a lot of noses from this, many of them would be around two centimeters long, but once in a while you would create something which is 2.5 centimeters, right? Because it's taking a, a sample from a distribution and this distribution is, you know, maybe it's got some kind of a Gaussian flavor as well. So by taking, by, by taking an image, by drawing data from, uh, rather by training the data on not the original data, but on the distribution of the data, you get something called variational autoencoders. Okay, this is a very strong concept. Okay, but it so here here are some details of it. So this is the original method. Okay, where you simply taking an image, you're encoding it, and then you're decoding. This is the normal variation encoder, right? So you've got these latent vectors which we call the hidden variables. Now what you're doing is you're replacing this this bottleneck with um, a mean value. So I said, as I said, the mean could be, let's say two centimeters and you're replacing it with a standard deviation. So the standard deviation could be, let's say 0 0.2, uh, 0 0.3 centimeters, okay? So the mean nose length is two centimeters, the standard deviation is 0 0.3 centimeters, right? So what this is going to do is it's going to create a bottleneck which has the mean, okay? So the mean uh, is, let's say it's called a mu. So let's say we call it the mean a mu and we're calling the standard deviation a sigma, okay? So we're calling this a sigma. And then what we're doing is we're taking a sample from this for training purposes. So we're not taking the original data for training. Uh, so we've got, we've got now three examples of how we take doing training in autoencoders. In the first case, we took the original data, right? In the second case, we took the noisy data. Now in the third case, we are creating, we're trying to train the, uh, we're trying to figure out what the mean and the standard deviation are. We're taking a sample from that and now we're using that for training. Okay, so it's a completely novel concept. Now the question is how do we do back propagation when you have sampling involved, okay? Um, can you think that it would be a problem? Can you see why it would be a problem? Because sampling from a standard, from a mean, uh, I mean, back propagation doesn't really work in that way. It doesn't know how, that, how would you actually, if you've got sampling over here, uh, what's the function? And this is completely different kind of function that we've used so far. So uh, if you have a function, which was like a nonlinear activation, you know how to take the gradient of it, right? How do you take the gradient of a sampling? 
So that's tough, right? So we don't know how to do that. So, so back propagation kind of fails when you do sampling, okay? So it include, introduces something called a reparameterization re trick, okay? It's a fairly simple thing that they've introduced over here. What they do is they say that uh, they came. Uh, the random variable can be rewritten, and hopefully all of you should know this if you've done some basic probability, that if you have a random variable z, you can recreate it as a mu, the mean value, plus the standard deviation, okay, multiplied by an epsilon, which is now the random variable, okay? So these are fixed, okay? So here, suppose the distribution of the nodes, okay? The mean is fixed at two centimeters. The standard deviation is 0.3 centimeters, right? Now, what we're saying is we're going to pick a random number. How do we pick a random number? We're going to take two centimeters. We're going to take 0.3 centimeters, the standard deviation. And now we're going to take an epsilon, and this epsilon is now taken from a Gaussian distribution, okay? It's a normal distribution which has a mean of one, which has a, st a standard deviation of one and a mean of zero, okay? So I hope some of you, uh, uh, I'm not losing some of you. If you take a random number from here, sometimes it will be zero, sometimes it will be plus one, sometimes it will be negative 0.5. You can imagine that if you're taking a random number epsilon, from a normal distribution, it could be any number between minus infinity plus infinity, but have a certain standard deviation. You multiply that over here with the, sta the actual standard deviation, right? So suppose that we take epsilon to be point, point 0.5. So what are we going to take? What's Z going to be? What's the, the value of the, no the length of the nose going to be? It's going to be two plus point 0.3 and the random value, which this particular random value comes out to be 0.5, right? So this comes out to be 1.5 and it's going to be 4.5. So this random value is going to be 4.5. So basically what we've done is we've taken Z and we've broken it up into the mean value, standard deviation value, and an epsilon, okay? What's the purpose of this? And this is where uh, it becomes easy. This is using a slide which has using different parameters, but think of this as your uh, sigma, the standard deviation, and think of this as the mu. This was the normal back propagation, and we didn't know how to, uh, because Z was a sample from here, we didn't know how to train it, okay? Now we, what we're doing is instead of Z being uh, written in the following way, we're going to write Z as a sum of sigma plus mu, plus a combination of epsilon. This is the random value, right? Now, when you're training it, we don't really need to train epsilon because that's just a normally distributed random value, right? What do we need to train? How, what do we need to find out? We need to find out the what is the mean of the nose length. We need to find out what is the standard deviation. And that those, those are not being sampled, okay? The sampling portion is simply over here. So we've separated the sampling from the, the mean and the standard deviation. So by doing this, now we can use the, apply the normal back propagation algorithm, okay? So basically now, uh, the variational autoencoders can now use the standard back propagation algorithm and can now be used for a variety of purposes. What they're gonna be used for, we'll continue on next time, okay? We'll see how this links in with all the fancy things that you might have seen, you might have heard of deep fakes and, and, and style GANs and so on. And we'll see how this links in with that as well. Okay. Yes, so it's basically training. So when you're giving it a lot of data, so here it's going to be supervised or unsupervised? Um, it's going to be again unsupervised, right? Because you're tra training it on the data it's trying to reproduce the original data, but now what it's trying to do is create a slightly changed version of the original data. But it's going to change, make the change based on some random, uh, based on drawing it uh, from the, the, the distribution of the original data. So it's going to hopefully, if you create a new face based on this, it should look like the original face but with some variation, right? So instead of the 
nose being this long, it might be sometimes very long or sometimes very short, right? The eyes might look a little different. So this is how you in introduce variations in the output by introducing the concept of having, drawing the data from the, uh, from the distribution. So, so when you're creating a new piece of data, again, you're going to generate that, the new data from where? From the sampling. Okay, so once you've trained it to know what the mean and the standard deviation is, if you want to create a new image, then you're going to simply uh, use the, the distribution of that to draw a new image. Speak enough. So any questions? Any online questions? Yeah. Sorry? Ah, so I've, I haven't really talked about this. So the loss equation is a little tricky. But all that needs to be explained over here is that it's got an expectation over here, okay? So there's an expectation, why? Because it is something, right? So there's randomness involved. So I haven't talked about this. This is, uh, this is a little bit of math, but the loss equation is not that trivial, okay? When you're talking about um, variational autoencoders, the loss equation is going to be more complex. It's going to be an expectation and, and so on, okay? But we'll see if we can talk about this in more detail necessarily. 